you hear me well? All right, salam alaikum. Hello, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, I just want to start off by letting you know my name is Aisha. I'm the president of the Muslim Student Association here at Penn State Harrisburg. I just want to welcome you all for, you know, to come to this event and whatnot. Um, without further ado, let's welcome Omar. He's a well-known Palestinian-American activist, communi community organizer. So, yeah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So I think uh, before we begin, um, I think it's essential and important that we start with gratitude. Um, and Aisha humbly stood up here and didn't speak about how much effort she put in to get all of us in this room together. So before we start, could we get a round of applause for, for Aisha? Knowing what we know and seeing what we've seen on the university campuses across this country. Um, and today, we're going to be direct in the way that we speak. What we've seen happen in the past 100 days, one of the most impactful things that's happened is it's given us the courage, the strength, and the motivation to speak direct. Now, what we're seeing in places like Harvard, where the first black woman ever to be the president of the school, of the university, a university like the university that we're in today, that is built on the principles of freedom of speech, was taken away. And what Aisha was able to do was to continue to fight to continue to work in order for the voices of Palestinians, which have been omitted on the national scale, on the international scale, to make sure that in her, lo her locality, in her spaces of influence, that she would not let that occur. So again, before we start, I want to emphasize how important this moment is, not just for what we're going to learn, not just for the conversation that we're going to have, not just for the context of Palestine, but the context of freedom of speech and the human courage and the moral courage to stand for it even in a time when the president, the president of Harvard University can be booted, a student from Penn State will still stand. So please give her another round of applause. So now where do we start? The question today, and I, I don't usually do academic uh, uh, presentations because I read a book a long time ago that taught me that the teacher-student relationship is not the way that we know it. That's not about a person coming to lecture and people listening to that lecture, but rather the student is the teacher and the teacher is the student. So this relationship that we have for the next hour is not meant for me to come and just give information, but rather for us collectively to derive some sort of truth with what we have access to. So keep that in mind. At any time, based on the circumstance, if you do raise your hand, if we do need to slow down, if we do need to increase our pace, I'm a human just like everyone else here. So just raise your hand and, and we'll make that work, okay? So, I told him to give me two mics because I, have, I can't stand still when I give speeches. So essentially what we're going to do today is we have 100 years of history to try to get in in an hour. So what's important for us prior to even starting or even getting into the history is again to frame this discussion that we're having. So my name is Omar Musa. I introduce myself. I uh, am a Harrisburg native. I see a lot of family that I've I've known for a long time that are here in the crowd right now. Um, I went to Temple University for my undergraduate degree where I studied economics. I moved to Pittsburgh. While in Pittsburgh, I was on the board of the Islamic Center of Pittsburgh, where I focused mostly on multi-faith, interfaith work and coalition building. Um, and that's where my activism began. Uh, a few years later, about three, four years later, I moved to Jerusalem where I studied my master's degree at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and my thesis focused on the developing discourse of the Palestinian refugee right to return. 
So the reason I give that background is because in the spaces that I occupy today, it's very important for us to, uh, to understand, especially when I speak to, to university students, knowledge is key. Knowledge is important and it's the source. But at the same time, we need to develop our skills as activists. Knowledge alone won't transform the realities that we live in because as we'll see, there's a plethora of knowledge. But these questions continue to return and how do we change and impact the reality that we live in today, right? And these mechanisms of power that exists. So what we're gonna do today is frame, reframe Palestine because you can't understand what's going on now unless you truly understand the context of what the Palestinian people have been up against since the late 1800s and the early 1900s. We can't look at what's happening in Gaza today, the genocide that is occurring in Gaza today. We can't put into context the court case at the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, that just this morning South Africa presented without understanding the context of how we got to this point. But at the same time, sometimes we are pushed away from making change in the moment by the weaponizing of the word complexity, right? That's something that, how many people here have, how many people here, this is the first time they've heard of Palestine? Okay, that's good. How many people here feel like they know a lot about the Palestinian identity, the Palestinian struggle, the history of Palestine? Okay. How many people here, because of the situations that have happened since October, in the past 100 days, have become more motivated to learn more about what is going on? Okay. So even people who said they knew raised their hand which is extremely important. So when we frame now, we're going to get into it. Framing what's going on in Palestine today, we have to go back. And, and, and I'll put this slide here because these are a lot of words that we hear when we, when we start to think about Palestine, right? We hear the word occupation. We hear the word violence. We hear settlements. We hear impunity. We hear um, um, accountability. We hear words like military detention, um, Jerusalem, uh, refugees, right of return, and these things become weaponized by mechanisms of power to say this is a complex issue, to say that there's been fighting for thousands of years, so on and so forth, when the issue, and this is the most important thing for those that leave early, for example, the most important thing is that this is one of the most simple issues in the world. The issue is that we have a people that are occupied and we have people that are op occupying them. So if you, if you learn nothing from the next hour, that is the most simple thing to leave this room from, is that there are human beings in Palestine, in Gaza, in the West Bank. Actually, let's talk about that before we get into it. In historic Palestine today, where are we? Being Palestinian, and raise your hand if you're Palestinian. So we have some Palestinians here. As Palestinians, we don't have one identity from the scope of colonization. If you are a Palestinian in Gaza, you have a different identification than if you're a Palestinian in the West Bank. If you're a Palestinian in the West Bank, you have a different identification than if you're a Palestinian in East Jerusalem. If you're a Palestinian in East Jerusalem, you have a different identification than if you're a Palestinian in what's called Israel. And if you're in the diaspora, you also have a different identification. This in and of itself is why human rights organizations like Amnesty International and uh, Human Rights Watch have come out and basically utilized the separation of identity as one of the classifications of apartheid. Because being in the West Bank or being in Gaza, you are occupied by an occupying force. So what we're seeing right now in terms of genocide is happening to, in, in Gaza, is happening to 2.2 million people who don't have any rights for the governing body that's governing Gaza. So think about that. We live in a country, and we know the hypocrisy of our country, 
you know, the famous words of Malcolm X, democracy is hypocrisy. We know the hypocrisy, hypocrisy of our country that says that fought for their rights, no taxation without representation. That's the underlying principle in which we sit here as Americans in terms of the development of this country. When you have people in Gaza, 2.2 million, who don't have the mobility, don't, don't have the right to go in and out, who are under blockade and siege. What is blockade and siege? In Gaza, nothing goes in and nothing goes out without Israel, without, without the Israeli uh, um, IDF or army kind of operating that section. Um, food, water, electricity. As we've seen in the past 100 days that have been cut off from the people inside of Gaza, have been cut off by the occupying force. Since 2006, Gaza has been by air, land, and sea completely sieged and blocked from the world. So we're in 2024 now. 2024, a population of 2.2 million, of which half are children. In the West Bank, you have about 3 million Palestinians that live under daily occupation. So you might hear words like checkpoints. You might hear words like enclaves. You might hear, hear words like settlements. What are settlements? Why is that an obstruction to Palestinian uh, self-determination and liberation? Again, in the West Bank, you have people that don't vote or have no voice in the representation of the force that occupies them and administers. And we'll get in more detail about that in a bit. Then you have those in East Jerusalem. In East Jerusalem, you have hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who have what you call Jerusalem residency. So again, this is not citizenship, although they pay taxes to the state of Israel. The police force that occupies their spaces are Israeli. Uh, the government that depicts the laws and administers and, and executes the laws in which they abide by are Israeli. The taxes that they pay go to Israel, but they have no vote or no representation in any of the uh, federal Knesset. So again, now we've talked about 2.2 million, 3 million, 5.2 million, and close to four or 500,000 in East Jerusalem. So you have about 6 million people between the river and the sea who have absolutely no rights, absolutely no rights as human beings. And then you have the 2 million Palestinians who have Israeli IDs. And we'll get into the history of this too. What does that mean? How did that happen? Who are those people? And those people live in what we call uh, Jim Crow Israel. So those of you that know American history, you know the Jim Crow South. You know the civil rights movement and, and what went on in terms of the organization in this country in the civil rights movement in order to get simple, basic human rights for our black brothers and sisters in America. Basic, simple human rights. Um, and we still know that there's segregation and we know that there's white supremacy that exists even in the legislation and the practices that we have today. But the Jim Crow South is where that was more open and we had segregation in the legislation of this country. So how did we get here? How did we get to a place where one people have more than five identifications, where one people have been split and divided and occupied and oppressed so much that they have five different identifications and the plight that comes with that. The Palestinian people, the most amazing thing, and, and I know, let me try to change pace here because for, uh, I wanna make sure that we stay energized. Um, I know myself for the past 100 days, this has been the most difficult period of my life. I know for the past 100 days, the ability to eat, sleep, the ability to sit with my family, um, the ability to stay in one place is something that I have not had the ability to do. Seeing and watching a genocide unfold in front of us while the whole Western world and the country that we live in gaslights the reality of this genocide, works to silence the voices of the people that are standing up for the people that are being genocided, as well as mainstream legacy media perpetuating propaganda and dehumanizing those same people, 
has been one of the most difficult things for me as an individual to swallow and to work with, regardless of how many years I've been doing activism in this space. Um, Abu Sitta, which is one of the doctors that became quite notable, you've probably seen him on Instagram, uh, one of the doctors at Al Ahli Hospital, uh, who described the horrific, the horrific circumstances in which he had to do amputations without necessary uh, medical supplies, without anesthesia, when he saw the burns, the fourth degree burns of white phosphorus bombs being used. And he's been in Gaza for a very long time and, and his words are very important. He said, what I usually see, and we'll talk about this when we get into some of Gaza or Gaza's history, what I usually deal with is a flood, but this was a tsunami. This was a tsunami. And when we talk about a tsunami, when we talk about 10,000 children being killed, 30,000 men, women, and children, civilians, innocent people being killed. And today at the ICJ, we had, I think from a historical perspective, in, in, in my view, one of the most um, heroic stories in which a country that underwent, and people, like those lawyers that underwent apartheid and understand white supremacy and understand colonization, who fought against it and are working towards re reconciliation in their country, who have taken spaces in, of power in their country, are standing up, the first ones to stand up in the world court against this type of genocide something that they're used to, something that they've seen in their own history. But at the same time, I want to give you guys a story. At the same time, as an activist um, and as a human being, the amount of work that we have to do, and this is something that, that one of my good friends um, told me as well when we talk about Claudine Gay, uh, who was the Harvard president that was ousted. But you know in this country for a black woman, you got to do twice as much to get half as far. So when we look at, as Palestinians, or we, we look at this human crisis, and we see 30,000 people being killed, we see over 55, 60,000 people injured, 100,000 casualties. We see 70% of the infrastructure in Gaza completely destroyed. 2 million of the 2.2 million people displaced on the streets, houses. One toilet for every 4,500 people. And with all that, we still have to prove that it's a genocide. And where this became for me, where this became visual, when I was at the Hebrew University, this was 2018, um, there was an event in, in Jerusalem in a town called Sheikh Jarrah. Has anyone heard of that? Raise your hand if you heard of that before. If you guys know, in Sheikh Jarrah, there's a place called the American Colony. The American Colony Hotel was, was hosting an event, um, and they called it 25 years after Oslo. We get into any, raise your hand if you know what Oslo is. All right, good. So we'll get into some historical stuff. Long story short, before we get into it, this event was an event of dignitaries, of diplomats, who came to the American Colony Hotel, and they wanted to discuss what has been done for the Palestinian people 25 years since the Oslo. In a small summary, Oslo was an attempt at peace talks, and we'll get into some of that history. In 1993, um, you know, Bill Gates, Yasser Arafat, Yitzhak Rabin, some of the notable names that, that uh, were involved in that. So, you know, you're in the middle of Sheikh Jarrah, which for those that don't know, back in 2021, was where Muhammad al-Kurd, if you guys have seen him, who has gained nobility um, and some popularity as well since he was a child, his family was being forcefully evicted, and we don't like to use that term, forcefully uh, removed from their homes so that settlers from America could come live in them. And that became a world story because him and his family went on 
a worldwide campaign to shed light on the reality of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who have been forcefully displaced from their house and this being the next chapter in that what some call ethnic cleansing, um, forced expulsion, others will say. So in this neighborhood in Sheikh Jarrah, where these people are going through the realities of forced expulsions, they were having this event. And they had, you know, some Israeli uh, representation, some Palestinian representation. And I went with a cohort of students from the Hebrew University from a cur curiosity perspective. Um, and I recall as the event started and we're sitting in this very, very nice room with nice coffee, um, drinks, food, hors d'oeuvres. Uh, I mean, it was stunning. It's a stunning hotel. If, if, if you go, I mean, you should check it out. Um, and the Palestinian speaker started to speak, and I think he came to an end. Uh, and we were on the second floor, and there's a, there's a courthouse and a cafe in one section. And at some point, you know, you start to hear some ruffling in the cafe. Um, and next thing you know, someone comes in the room speaking Arabic. And behind him, about 15 others. And they come up to the front where the table is set up, and they take the microphone. And they say, for 25 years, for 25 years, you guys have been talking about peace. We haven't seen anything from it. We've seen absolutely nothing from it. So everybody can get up and leave. In Arabic. So in this moment, in this moment, there's this, and you know, as students, you guys will, will face this, right? There is a change going on right now. I'm not taking away or discrediting what's happening at the ICJ. But at the same time on Saturday, everybody better be on the streets. The power of the people is extremely important. And those, those young men had a point. And that is the underlying theme of, of the paradigm, the view, the perception that I need everyone to get in when we go through this presentation. Because what those young men represented to me was what's been happening to Palestinians. What's been happening to Palestinians is throughout the years, and we'll start, at, we'll start in the late 1800s and 1900s, and what is the most motivating thing for me as a Palestinian and as an activist and as a, a human activist, a human rights activist, is the resilience that Palestinians have had for a hundred years going up against two things, imperialism from the largest superpowers in world history, as well as clo col colonial settlerism. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about what that means. But I, I, want, I want everybody to stay in that, that mindset in terms of the people, the people, the power of the people and colonial and imperial powers stripping that and working as hard as they can, like Jabotinsky said, and we'll get into it, to create an iron wall. Jabotinsky is the father of revisionist Zionism, which we'll get into. And his methodology, his ideology, his school of thought was to create an iron wall, which was necessary. And this is extremely important which was necessary for the Zionist movement to prosper and an independent Jewish state to be built on top of Palestine. They needed an iron wall of imperial power, which was served by the British at that time, so that the hopes, the hopes of resistance from the indigenous Palestinian population would be crushed. So we'll get into why this is important, this, this metaphor of an iron wall and, and how this developed. So again, I know that was a lot, guys. That was, that was more so, I'm, I'm going to take a step back from the, a, the academic and get into the activist. That was more so for us to get into a state of mind, to remember the people. Now we're going to start walking through some things. Um, and I got, a, I got a laser pointer, too. So... Another thing that I want to get out of this, and, and I know I'm going to go over time because I just spent a lot of time on that, um, is we're not going to be able to cover everything. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. But what we can do is 
give pieces of knowledge of academic resources that you guys can take away from this and utilize that as a starting place for you guys to start to understand more and more and more of what it means for an indigenous people to stand and fight against imperial and colonial powers. So we're gonna start by going through, or at least we're gonna frame our discussion um, with uh, Rashid Khalidi's work. Um, how many people have heard of Rashid Khalidi? Two people, which is good. So this is something that, that uh, he wrote a book called um, A Hundred Years War. And essentially his thesis is to frame the past hundred years in what he calls declarations of war against the Palestinian people. Declarations of war against the Palestinian people um, with these, with a few different uh, uh, milestones. The first declaration of war that Khalidi describes um, has to do with the Belfour Declaration and the Mandate of Palestine. Um, and I would actually add, add um, a couple things in that, if I could, from my own academic space um, in terms of the JCA, the Jewish Colonization Association, um, as well as the 1936 uh, Arab Revolt. So let's start in 1917 and what that looks like. What is the Belfort Declaration? The Belfort Declaration was written by Belfort in 1917 as a promise, and we can read it here, as a promise to the Rothschilds, um, and we could, I think a couple of terminology points are important here. I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government view the favor, the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this objective it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done with, which may uh, prejudice the civil and religious rights of the existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. So this is the first declaration of war. And declaration of war is, is built on the idea of, of what we later would discuss with Edward Said in terms of Orientalism, otherizing the indigenous people, otherizing brown and black bodies, essentially is how we would interpret it today from our activist spaces, right? So when you look at first the 1917 Belfort Declaration, what we see here is a declaration uh, of support for uh, the Zionist dream of a Jewish, of a Jewish national state, um, as well as we see absolutely nothing about Palestinians. The Palestinians in this declaration are described as the non-Jewish communities. The indigenous people, the majority group in this declaration are described as non-Jewish majority, the non-Jewish communities in Palestine. So at this time in 1917, there was about 50,000 uh, Jewish people in Palestine. Palestinians at the time were 95% of the population. So 95% of the population, 90, 95, 96% of the population was considered the non-Jewish communities of Palestine. This was the first declaration of war. The second declaration came a little bit later on with the British Mandate. So after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the British Mandate came and the colonization of the Middle East occurred. And the British Mandate had between nine and 10 articles uh, describing the support of the Zionist movement and a Jewish national home in Palestine. Absolutely nothing in the Mandate said anything about Palestinians. The largest imperial force in the world, colonizing indigenous people, promising them an independent state, but nowhere in writing, including, or describing their right to self-determination. So this is what he describes as the first uh, declaration of war against the Palestinians. So what happened? What happened in that period of time? What happened in that period of time, and we'll go through this uh, pretty quickly, we'll get to like uh, the, the next kind of steps because there's a lot, a lot to go through here, but the indigenous population saw this. The indigenous population that had no access to 
the, the economic, social, or political spheres inside the British mandate, um, pushed back against this. And then you started to see the, these revolts happening in the 1920s, um, the 1925, as the immigration from Europe, um, uh, of Europe, and this was, you know, in, in the early 20s, mid to mid 30s, as the immigration of Europe and the population of Jewish people started to increase, the indigenous population started to look around and say, hey, we are being negatively impacted by this. We need to appeal to the serving government of the area, the Brits um, at that time, and essentially voice our concerns. And what this led to was what we saw in 1936. In 1936, a widespread organized boycott and, and, and forms of civil disobedience, as we see, right? It's always important to look at this through the lens of what we're going through today. Because sometimes we look at it like we were the first people to do it, or we look for our history to understand what we should do. In 1936, a huge successful organized civil disobedience, as well as boycott of both British goods um, and as well as the Jewish um, uh, population as well in, in Mandate Palestine. So this revolt actually gained the attention of the British. They said, okay, man, we, we have a lot of these Palestinians who are, are creating a fuss. We need to figure out what to do. So they send um, a person from, a person, uh, Peel, to, to create what we call the Peel's Commission. So the Peel's Commission is essentially is what we can now look at this in terms of how colonial and imperial powers look to solve solutions of indigenous people and colonization of their land. So they come in with Peel, and the Peel's Commission was basically a way to split the land. They said, okay, we have an issue here. We have a potential solution. We're going to split this land. We're going to give, you know, 55% to the Jewish population for a Jewish homeland, and then we'll give 45% of, uh, of the land to the Arab population. So on and so forth. We'll get into more details of, like, how the land was split when we get to the partition. But essentially the Arabs were saying, uh, the Palestinians were saying, absolutely not. This is, this is not at all what we're going to do. So beginning those revolts, essentially the Palestinian population denied the Peel's Commission, and then there was a response from the British mandate at the time. And what we saw at that time, the response, the Iron Wall, the response of the British and the imperial powers to indigenous uprising, to indigenous organizing, to indigenous unification, right? Because as activists, that's what we do, right? As activists, as students, as people that want to make impact in this world, what we do is try to understand how do we build people power by galvanizing the masses around the goal of justice. The response is what we've been seeing. The response in 1936 um, um, of what we saw is a very violent response to civil disobedience. And you can see some of the things, some of the statistics here. More than 20,000 casualties, 5,000 were killed um, by the British, killed to, to some of the terrorism that was occurring from when we'll get into the formation of militia groups um, in the Zionist movement. Um, and by one estimate, look at this number, by one estimate, 10% of adult males, adult Palestinian population between 20 and 60 were killed, wounded, imprisoned, or exiled. This is 1936. 10% of the adult male Palestinian population between 20 and 60 were killed, wounded, imprisoned, or exiled. Why do I repeat that? In the academic space, we tend to gloss over these milestones of things that happened, right? We say, oh, 1967 was the, the Civil Rights Act. We talk about in 1936, it was the Arab Revolt, the Palestinian Revolt. But what does it mean for a population to lose 10%, 10% of its adult, in this case, adult male population? What does it mean in Gaza today, in 100 days, to lose 35, 40,000 people? 
What does it mean to have 100,000 casualties? What did it do to these Palestinians in 1936 that were organizing around their basic human rights of self-determination to, because of that, lose 10% of their adult male population? These are things that we need to dig deeper into. How does that deflate? How does that try to crush the hopes as well as the actual state building infrastructure of a people? Even after that, if you decide, okay, well, we'll give you some land to build your state on. How does the destruction of civil infrastructure, the destruction of human life, the destruction of the people that would build a state impact the ability to build a state? These are the questions that we gloss by. So where we go from there are a quick highlight of the other uh, uh, declarations of war, and then we'll slowly go through, not slowly, but we'll, we'll, we'll glance through, through, through some of them. So the next one, and again, through this prism or this paradigm of completely omitting the Palestinians as human beings. That's the declaration of war by imperial powers as well as the colonial settlers, the Zionist movement. One is the partition plan of 1947. Uh, the UN Resolution 242 in 1967, the invasion of Lebanon in 1989, uh, what, we, what you've probably heard a lot of, the Intifada, um, as, well as, Oslo's, uh, as well as Oslo in the, in the early 90s, and lastly, the, the siege um, of, of Gaza, which we'll get into some of those, of those details as well. Um, so moving forward, the partition plan. So we talked about 1936, that went on to about 1939, this huge devastating blow to the Palestinian indigenous uh, population of Mandate Palestine. In that time period, up until 1947, we, they still started to see increased migration. Increased migration, the buying of land, the uh, dispossessing of, of land for the Palestinian people, as well as the exclusion of Palestinian people in the decision-making bodies of the mandate. It's extremely important. Um, and what we want to get into here is essentially this premise, right? Some of these myths that we hear, and I thought about this a lot. We hear a lot of these myths of the past and what happened and why we are where we are. But with just a little bit of, of information, you don't have to go get a master's degree from Jerusalem to know this, trust me. With just a little bit of digging, a little bit of information from internationally recognized bodies, we start to understand from a colonial perspective what was going on, as well from an indigenous perspective or from a people perspective, what was the reality that these people faced? So I wrote here, and, and this is me just pulling, pulling things out um, of some of the writings, but you know, in 1947, a partition resolution explicitly assumed to be the defining moment in which a, a fair and palace pragmatic compressor formula for the resolution, right? Like, we got this. We know how to figure this out. Um, we'll, we'll fix this conflict. And this partition was given to both the Jewish and the Arabs. And essentially, obviously, the statesmanlike and, uh, and the accommodating Zionist movement accepted it. But those barbaric uh, Palestinians uh, that don't understand what it means to build a state, they rejected it. Right? This is something that you hear often. Oh, we gave them a deal and they rejected it. We gave them a deal and they rejected it. We gave them a deal and they rejected it. So before we get into this deal, what I want people to do when they're watching TV right now, when you're on Instagram, when you're on TikTok, when you see Israel's propaganda being exposed completely, when we look, and there's so much has happened that we've already forgot what happened in the beginning. When we look at a calendar, with the days of the week, an Israeli propaganda machine is telling that these are the names of Hamas members. Right? When we look at Shireen Abu Akle, who was an American Palestinian journalist in Jenin, who was shot and killed by the Israeli military, their immediate response afterward was to say it wasn't us, it was the Palestinians that killed her. After investigation, it was proven that it was an Israeli IDF member that sniped her from meters away, right? So now they say, okay, it was us, but it was an accident. So we see this propaganda, we see this propaganda. So when you're watching, understand that what you're seeing 
what you're seeing because now we have the technology and some and we have the people power to show it these things have happened before these things are happened before so utilize your the new glasses that you have now to look at the 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 realities of what was happening in the past so what happened in 1947 there's a lot written here but it's very important it's very important prior to getting into what we will next which is the uh, the nekba this was the deal this was the deal in 1947 so you have a palestinian population who makes up the majority of the country okay who owns at that time 93% of the private land, 93% of the private land, who were being dispossessed because of accelerated migration. Now at this point, in, in 1917, 1918, there was about 60,000 Jews in, in mandate Pal what became Mandate Palestine in 1922. By 1947, there was over 600,000. So I don't know about you guys, but there's, there's, there's not a lot of ways to make that many babies that quickly, right? There's a process of how babies are made. So this was the deal. The Zionists pre-post. Land ownership, 7%. In the partition plan, they would have gained 55% of the land. That's 15 million dunum. Um, dunum is uh, basically divide that by four and you'll get how much acreage that is. Of that 15 million... 89% was owned by Palestinians. So you as the indigenous population would be forgiving or forfeiting 89% of your possession from a land perspective. On the other side, the land ownership went from 90% to 45%. And that 45% was 12 million dunum, of which only 1% was owned privately by Zionists. So... What about the structure of the land, right? It's not, in and of itself, that would be a very bad deal to make from a leadership perspective and from the idea of colonization. This is an indigenous people fighting against colonization whose imperial powers that enforce the law on the area said, this is the iron wall, you take it or leave it. This is what we're going through. This is what they went through. When you look at Gaza today and you see the bombardment and you see the, the international diplomatic cover by the United States, not just in talking points, not just by the president, the secretary of state, but also by the governing bodies of the world. By the governing bodies of the world. When the UN Security Council can put a vote for a ceasefire after tens of thousands of people have been murdered, and the United States is the only country out of 16 to vote no, to veto it, that shows you what the Iron Wall is. This is the Iron Wall. At that time, it was the British, and now it's the United States, and obviously many others. So these are just important things, from, from, and we'll go through them quickly, but very important, very important, because again, the partition plan is something that's thrown at the Palestinians every time you have a discussion with opposition. But we're now at a time where it's absolutely seen as a fallacy. Most of the fertile coastal plains, Haifa, Yaffa, all the interior plains were on the land of, of what was promised to the Zionists. These include all, mostly all of the citrus and cereal producing areas. Citrus was the main export crop of the country, making up 80% of total value of exports before World War II. Also, a, f a full 40% of Palestinian industry and the major source of the country's electrical supply fell within the envisioned Jewish state. So they're like, why don't you guys just, we were, gonna, we were gonna give you back in 1948, 45% of the land, why didn't you take it? Why didn't you take it, right? This is America. Well, we, well, we hey, hey, you know, uh, we know, we know we brought African slaves from across the ocean, but you know, later on we made them worth three-fifths of a person. Why don't, you, why, don't you, why don't you just take... This is the type of colonial mindset that exists. This is our land. We are going to take this with force and terrorism, which we'll get into. And if we decide to feed you something, it's a take-it-or-leave-it situation. So imagine giving up 
what made up 80% of the total value of your exports, as well as 40% of, of, of your industry. The only two ports in Mandate Palestine, Yaffa and Haifa, were designated in the, in the new Jewish state. The whole lake of Tabariya or Tabiris was incorporated in the Jewish state. The upper reaches of the Jordan River were incorporated in the Jewish state. The only airport was incorporated in the Jewish state. And I put that twice by accident, but it's also very important. Because the only access to air was going to be in the envisioned Jewish state. The proposed frontiers of the Jewish state were delineated to accommodate 99% of Jewish colonies, along with plenty of surrounding area for organic growth. What does this mean? This means based on the lines that were drawn, based on the lines that were drawn, only about 1% of the, the Jewish population would have to be forcibly transferred. Right? But on the other side, um, which the, you know, the land designated Palestinians was, was landlocked, no direct access, um, as well as, or there it is, whereas a total of 800 Palestinian villages, about half of them fell within the new Jewish state. 400 villages would have been and were, but 400 villages were promised to be forcefully transferred in order to accommodate the new Jewish state. In what world, in what world of equality, of equity, of basic human rights, does this make sense that a group of people would accept this? So the response, even with that, the response, the response to the uneven separation of land, the response to the forcible removal of population, was very interesting because some of us, what, is this the first time that people have seen ICJ in the news? Did everyone know about the ICJ before the International Court of Justice? So the Arab delegations requested, they said, hey, before taking a decision on this partition, we want to go to the International Court of Justice and ask for the opinion in the following manners. One, whether or not Palestine was included in the Arab territories that had been promised independence by the British before World War I. This is very important because at the same time period in the late 30s and the early 40s were a lot of surrounding Middle Eastern states that gained their independence. And Palestine was no different because this was the promise of the British um, during the mandate period. What is a mandate, by the way? Quickly. Does anyone know what a mandate is? Why didn't, why didn't they call them colonies like they did in America? A mandate, this is like these terms, like what ethnic cleansing? What is ethnic cleansing? Genocide. Ethnic cleansing is genocide, forced expulsion of human beings. You're not cleaning anything, right? Same thing with a mandate. A mandate is a promise to basically the indigenous population of, hey, we know you guys don't know how to govern yourselves. We're going to come in here. We're going to give you some structure. And then 20, 30, 40 years from now, we'll let you guys have your own government. This is what a mandate is. So as these other Arab states were gaining their independence, Palestine was the only one, the only one that didn't. Whether the partition was consistent with the principles of the UN Charter, whether its adoption and forcible execution were within the competence or jurisdiction of the UN, and whether it lay within the power of any UN member or group members to implement partition without the consent of the majority of people living within the country. This is what we've been learning, and this is what we've been seeing over time. Diplomacy and seeking diplomacy has been met by indigenous people. Like indigenous people have gone through the channels and the mechanisms of di diplomacy only to be met with violence, terrorism, and, and the iron wall. So what we have here is on the right, our pointer. 15, what, what I want you to see here quickly, is these are the, the governmental sections of what was Mandate Palestine. Um, this is where I'm from, by the way. So you have Akka, you have Haifa, Jenin, Tul Karam, you have Yaffa, Nablus. What these circles are is the size of the circle represents the population. The percentage is the split of, um, this is 1946, the split between uh, Jewish and non-Jewish. Again, I'm using the words of the colonizers. Um, in those areas. 
or Palestinians, right? So the Palestinians in this particular example in Haifa was one of the largest uh, urban centers of Mandate Palestine and one of the most fruitful from an economic perspective. 53% uh, Palestinian, 47% Jewish, Kisi Akka, 96% uh, Palestinian. 15 out of the 16 districts were majority Palestinian. And what we see here on the left is exactly what I just described to you. This was the proposed partition. You have three enclaves that were given to the Palestinians, which were completely separate, uh, com completely separated. And then again, all of those details that we just spoke about. Um, now, what came after that is what we know as the Nakba. So quickly, uh, what's very important from uh, um, an his Israeli history perspective. In Israel, you have these two waves of historical ideologies. You have what's called the old historians and the new historians. When it comes to 1947, as we see today, as we see today, the old historians of Israel say, hey, these are the consequences of war. As we see today, with 100,000 civilian casualties, that's a consequence of war. So there has been a propagated education system from an old historian perspective in that time period up until today where the guise of war is utilized as the natural occurrences of why the Palestinians left their homelands. Then came the new historians, people like Ilan Pape, people like Avi Schleim, people kind of like Benny Morris, but that's a different question. With later released archives from the Israeli military, the UE, they started to piece together the story of ethnic cleansing, to shift this paradigm to perceive 1947 and 1948 not as a consequence of war or a miracle that happened, but rather a systemic and meticulously planned operation to forcibly displace the indigenous Palestinian people. Um, so we'll get into the definition. Actually, let's get into the definition. So the US State Department defines ethnic cleansing as a systemic and forced removal of members of an ethnic group from communities in order to change the ethnic composition of given region. Um, from the Foreign Relations Committee, there are two elements. The deliberate use of artillery against the civilian populations of big cities, the forced movement of civilian populations entailing the systemic destruction of homes, the looting of personal property, beatings, selective and random killings, and massacres. Does this at all sound familiar? What we are seeing in Gaza today is a clear demonstration of what is described here as ethnic cleansing. And we'll get into those details. Um, so from the perspective of formulating uh, a defense, let's say, uh, similar to what we saw at the I ICJ, but a little bit different, um, the three components of what happened in 1947 being defined as ethnic cleansing and this shifting in paradigm to the new historians. One is that the expulsion of the indigenous Arab Palestinian population was a motive and a goal at the highest levels of Zionist leadership. After the motive, the intelligence, the efforts to gather comprehensive intelligence of the indigenous Palestinians, Arabs, inhabitants in order to construct the meticulous plans to implement the operations, as well as the execution, which is a combination of intentions of leadership, as well as the necessary military in intelligence to culminate into a sophisticated plan that was administered to the military known as Plan Dalid, um, and was utilized for the ethnic cleansing of the indigenous Palestinians. So again, the thesis and approach to this, um, we, could, we could skip some of this essentially, but the principal objective is to create in Palestine uh, a purely Jewish state, a safe haven for Jews as the cradle of new Jewish nationalism, and a state that had to be exclusively Jewish, not only in socio-political structure, but also in its ethnic composition. Um, so we're looking at the motives here and some of the motives in terms of we can look into the diaries and the private correspondences of 
Uh, ben Gurion was one of the leaders of the Zionist movement who said the Arabs will have to go, but one needs an opportune moment for making it happen, such as war. Um, we can look at the father of, of political Zionism, um, Herzl. And again, I'm hovering over these things because of, of the time that we have, but we can get into more of it in the Q&A, as well as these are things that we should be studying as students of knowledge. Um, Jabotinsky, which was the father of the revisionist Zionist group, um, which again, we talked about the Iron Wall, spoke very vividly and openly about the Palestinians won't just leave their land because they love their land. We need to force them out and kill the hope that they have any ability to stay. And we'll get into why, why some of these leaders are important as well too. Next is what we call the filing of the villages. And this is where it comes to the intelligence. At the time, um, employees of the Jewish agency, um, who also was a historian at the Hebrew University, Ben Zayan, um, they basically pointed to how useful it would be to have a detailed registry of Palestinian villages and propose that to the Jewish National Fund. Um, and again, these were things that were utilized in the Israeli military. Um, and we'll get into some of these details of how they mapped the villages from an aerial perspective and also the details that they got um, in the next slide here. The contents are something that as Palestinians, we've, we've known about. A lot of this has been hidden from the public view, but topographic locations of each village, the access roads, quality of land, water springs, the main sources of income, socio-political composition, religious affiliations, names of the muhtars or the local leaders of the villages, um, relationships with other villages, um, the age of individual men, the registry, uh, and much more. They also had something called the hostility index, which they still use today, by the way, um, which is the level of a village's participation in revolts. Um, the material included in those lists include family names who had lost people in the fights, who, uh, from a collective punishment perspective that we'll get into the legislation today, have done something seemed to be threatening to uh, the Zionist groups at the time. Um, again, we can go through you know, the, the level of detail, the, the husbandry, the, the cultivation, the number of trees and the plantations, the quality of the fruit. I mean, you, it goes on and on. Each clan and its political affiliation social stratification between nobilities and common peasants, as they called them, um, the description of village mosques, the names of their imams, um, precise accounts of the interior, number of guards in each village, which most of the time were none. They created an informant spy network as well. Um, and again, this is the military intelligence and as uh, in the motive, military intelligence, the political involvement that we spoke about, um, and then what's important here is Plan Dalit, right? Taking the motivations that we see at the highest levels, just as we see today, right? The ICJ report from South Africa, that they were speaking today about had nine pages that referenced the leaders of Israel's um, intent to commit a genocide, nine pages. Nine pages. I mean, we've heard things such as we need to flatten Gaza. We need to kill everyone in Gaza. We need to, uh, references from the prime minister to Amalek, which is a, you know, a biblical reference to essentially wiping out of a, of a group of people, men, women, children, ch uh, babies, um, animals, so on and so forth. Um, we've seen the Israeli minister of defense it's Mar Ben Gavir, which we'll get more into as well. Um, talk about how we need to remove all the people from Gaza and have them voluntarily immigrate to other places. So in 1946, these operations by the, you know, the code Plan Dalit is what they're known as. And I don't need to do much explaining here other than describe what it says. These operations can be carried out in the following manner. By destroying villages, setting fire to them, blowing them up planting mines in their rubble, especially those population centers that are difficult to control permanently by mounting, combing, and control operations according to the following guidelines. Encirclement of the villages conducting a search inside of them. In the case of resistance, the armed forces must be wiped out and the population expelled outside the borders of the state. So, 1947 partition, 
We saw the unfair deal. The refusal of that deal by the Arab leadership, not, not just the Palestinian people, the Arab leadership at the time, but obviously the Palestinian people. And this plan that was initiated years prior, as we saw Ben Gurion say, waiting for an ample time to forcibly expel the Arabs, the Palestinians, the indigenous population of Mandate Palestine, in order for us to have an ethnically, an ethno state, an ethno Jewish state. So, who were the people that made up the, the militia that were responsible for the Nakba? 120,000 well trained soldiers in, in different groups. Um, different militias uh, have some written down here that you will probably hear, like the Urgon, the Lehi, the Haganah. Um, they depopulated 560 Palestinian cities and villages in 31 military operations, which carried out 90 massacres. And we Palestinians, we reference this as the Nakba, the catastrophe. We've also had Israeli politicians in, a, in, in leadership positions say in October that this is the next Nakba. They are referencing what I'm describing to you as what they are doing now. This is the next Nakba, and it's going to be even worse than the one that you guys had before. So these militia groups, by the way, are all designated as terrorist groups. Some of them designated terrorist groups by the imperial power of Britain. Others designated terrorist groups by themselves. The Lihi group called themselves a terrorist organization committed to terrorist acts. Um, re the refugee population at the time, 800,000 uh, Palestinians became refugees between that time period. Uh, we talked about these 90 massacres. This is extremely important. Some of these examples, because we see it today with, with these airstrikes as well. Two of these massacres that occurred during 1948 of the 90. One is a lid. 1,000 Palestinians, men, women, and children were killed. Another 500 died because they were expelled. And on their route during the, 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 the summer, this was in, in, in the summertime, they died of malnutrition, of exhaustion, no access to water, no access to food. Again, all these things that I'm saying, I, I, I hope they sound familiar because what, we're, what I'm describing is what you're seeing, but I'm describing it in 1947. 70,000 people expelled. 70,000 people expelled from this town. The military leader in charge of the, of the militia at that time, his name is Yitzhak Rabin. Has anyone ever heard that name before? Right. For those who haven't heard that name, the man who, in 1948, in 1948, when my grandfather was alive, this is not that many generations ago, the man who was responsible for one of the worst massacres, killing over 1,500 people and expelling 70,000 Yitzhak Rabin, went on to become the prime minister multiple times, of the, of the newly found Israeli state. So much so that in 1993, because of his actions at Oslo, he was given the Nobel Peace Prize. He was given the Nobel Peace Prize. So again, this there's, there's a couple things that this brings light to. One is what powers in place, right? What is this facade of international, uh, 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 the international court, right? This facade of the United Nations as some sort of international harborer of peace to bring justice to this world. Or things like the Nobel Peace Prize who can be given to well-known and documented terrorists. The next one, which a lot of you know, because it's a very, very popular one in terms of our history is Dir Yassin, which was one of the worst and bloody massacres and thousands of people expelled. 
At the time, that was undertaken by the, the Zionist militia terrorist group called the Urgun, of whose leader was Menahim Begin. Menahim Begin was one of the early members of the revisionist Zionist group, as we talked about Jabotinsky. Again, just so you know, the revisionist Zionist group is a group that believes that the Israeli state is from the river to the sea and beyond. This is in their charters, the river and the sea and beyond. That ideology was what headed the Ergon and those members like Menachem Begin. And that ideology, the revisionist Zionist group, is what became the Likud in 1977. The most voted for and popular political party in Israel, the Likud party, who is headed by Benjamin Netanyahu, was formed from the revisionist Zionist party. And these members, Menachem Begin, Deir Yassin, look it up. Women and children were stripped, lined up, photographed, slaughtered by automatic firing, and survivors have told of even more incredible um, barbaric um, activity. Those who were taken prisoners were treated with degrading brutality. So when you look at the videos in Gaza and you see all those men and women and children lined up naked on the soccer field, when you look at the women and children and men walking down the street with white flags and the woman who's holding her child and she's shot. This is Dir Yassin. This is Menachem Begin, who went on to become the prime minister of Israel and was given the Nobel Peace Prize. I don't know if, you've, if these things are as clear as Nobel Peace Prize. It's not just Nobel Peace Prize. Is, I'm not just mad because, oh, why are terrorists getting Nobel Peace Prizes? Yeah, I'm mad at that. That's definitely one. But also, as we start to talk about negotiating, as we start to talk about peace talks, these are the individuals who are representative of the Israeli government that we have to peace talk with. Individuals who carried out terrorist activity throughout, throughout their political and, and military careers who have these types of ideologies that they follow. And why that's important. That was then. Where are we now? That was then. Where are we now? The Minister of National Defense in Israel the country that is committing the genocide, the government that's committing a genocide on the Palestinian people who have been locked in a concentration camp since the early 2000s. His name is Itmar ben Gavir. Itmar ben Gavir, what is the uh, Minister of Defense? Or National, uh, I'm sorry, maybe it's the Minister of National Security. One of the two. Anyways, he's responsible for the police. He's responsible for the jail system. He's responsible for border defense. He's he, is, he lives in an illegal settlement in the West Bank. And he's also responsible for gun licenses. Since October 7th, more than 300,000 gun permits have been distributed to settlers in the West Bank. Itmar Ben Gavir was not allowed to enter the Israeli military at the age of 18 because of his terrorist activity. His, his, um, uh, his role model, who he had a picture of in his, in his room at his house, who he dressed up as for a particular uh, holiday, a, a Jewish holiday, is Baruch Goldstein. Does anyone know who Baruch Goldstein is? One person. Baruch Goldstein was the man, if you can call him that, who went into the Ibrahimi Masjid in Khalil, in Hebron, and shot worshippers in a mass shooting, killing more than 30 men, women, and children. 
This was Etmar Ben Gavir's role model. Can you imagine? Can you, can you imagine? I mean, look what they did to the nation of Islam in America. Called them terrorists, broke them from the inside. Look what they did to um, any social movement around the world, anti-imperialist movement around the world, liberation movement around the world. And they come and preach to us that this is democracy. And they preach that they're against, they're fighting against terrorism. But they send $4 billion a year to these people who are actually designated terrorists actually designated terrorist. Um, uh, the Minister of Finance, who used to be the Minister of Transportation, um, who when he was a Minister of Transportation, said we need to further Judaize the north of Israel. And this is something that we can get into discussion about what that means. Shmodrik, uh, he was also a designated terrorist. When in 2005, 2006, when Israel removed and dismantled the illegal settlements in Gaza, he was caught with hundreds of liters of gas in his attempt to go burn uh, and destroy cars and homes and villages as his retribution for it. These are the people who are at the highest forms of leadership in the Israeli government. The highest forms of leadership. Lastly, Menachem Begin, who got the Nobel Peace Prize in the 1970s, went on in the 1980s as the Prime Minister of Israel to invade Lebanon and was overseeing the worst ma one of the worst massacres in the history of the world, Sabr al-Shatila. Has anyone heard of that? We have people have heard of that. The Nobel Peace Prize winner went on to engage in a massacre in Lebanon in which about 3,500 or 4,000 Palestinian men, women, and children were massacred within hours. Within hours. The description of those days are horrifying. Only more horrifying is the actual images that we see now because they're a representation of what went on then. When they were walking through the villages and they saw women's, pregnant women whose stomach was cut open. 4,000 people in hours. These are the leaders that we are negotiating with. So now we're going to go back to, real quick, back to 1948. After those massacres that we just spoke about, I know we talked a little bit about now, but after some of those massacres, how are we doing on time here? I'm getting into it. Oof, we are not doing good on time, guys. So after those massacres, quickly, this is important, right? Um, What's, what's really important about this is the concept of, again, we go back to the paradigm of Palestinian people as humans. After the partition, after uh, the attacks, after the expulsion, after the Nakba, now the Israeli state controlled about 72% of the land. Um, in that time period, there was a, an attempted mediation as people were being expelled from their homes, as people were being forcefully expelled from their homes, genocided and murdered, uh, the UN mediated with the story of Bernadotte. So this is very important. He came in, analyzed the situation, and basically said there's three uh, uh, parts to how we can essentially mediate what occurred. One um, had to do with the recognition of the Jewish state, and the last one had to do with the refugees that were created due to the ethnic cleansing. Right. So he said the right of the refugees to return to their homes, if they so desire, must be safeguarded. The immediate solution to the problem seems simple or seems to simply to allow them to return to their original homes, even if their homes had been destroyed um, and their furniture and assets dispersed. So what he did was he submitted this to the, the provisional Israeli government, as well as to the international community. Um, as he calls it, without prejudice. And Israel's response that no refugees will be permitted to return. No refugees will be permitted to return. Does anyone want to take a guess about what happened next? Benadot was murdered by the Urgon. 
The Zionist militia group killed him. That's it. End of story. And they moved on. So this is, this is a map here. What this shows, and you know, since we only have like 10 minutes left here, there's a, I'm just going to skip through a lot of stuff here, or maybe there'll be a, a part two, because we haven't even gotten to 67. But essentially, these are, the dots are basically colored by the time period that they were depopulated, but these are the 530 villages that were depopulated um, during the 1947-1948 Nakba, as you can see there. So... What's very important now is this is one of the, the deeming factors of the motives of Zionist leadership. Why? Because after the immediate ethnic cleansing, after the opportunity came of war to forcefully explace and to genocide these people out of the region, what came next was codifying ethnic cleansing. So what does this mean to codify? The codification of ethnic cleansing came so that every possible uh, uh, way that we can prevent people from coming back. Why? Because of ethnic concentration, right? Demography, the demographic of Israel was to be an, 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 a Jewish majority. That was the primary goal. We need to expel the indigenous population. So you have the absentee property law of 1950s, you have the Citizenship Act of 1952, and you have the law of return of 1950. The absentee property, and I'm speeding up a quick, quickly because of time, and I'll probably end after 48, um, the absentee was any Palestinian that was uh, a citizen before that time period in 1947 was not allowed at all to return or become a citizen of the newly founded state, as well as all of their property, including homes, bank accounts, um, and everything in between, was then given to the state through the, uh, the codification of this law. Um, the Law of Return Act in the 1950s, what the Law of Return Act did was essentially gave the right to any Jewish person around the world um, whose grandmother, uh, mother or grandmother was Jewish and or whose grandchild, there's a little bit of a web that we can go through, essentially the right to come to the newly founded state and gain citizenship and that was solely for the rights of the Jewish people. Um, and that was now the reality of 1948 to 1950. The ethnic cleansing, the Nakba, the expulsion of 800,000 Palestinians, followed by the codification to not allow them to return, and all of those terrorist militia groups becoming what now is the military wing and the political wing of this newly founded state. So, um, you know, from there, we were going to go into 1967. Um, 1973, uh, as well as Gaza, but I don't think we have enough time. I think we're out of here at one o'clock and we have nine minutes. So one of two things, I was going to spend some time because there's a period of, we didn't speak at all about the period of occupation and the codification of occupation and what that looked like. We didn't speak about Israeli settlements, the West Bank, but if I can essentially add two things as a summary point, and then we can either talk about the ICJ or we can just have some quick questions, probably be better. But in summary, what we see today in Gaza are those refugees of 1948. 80% of Palestinians in Gaza are refugees from 1948 and 1967, who were forcefully displaced from their homes, who lived in Gaza, which from the words of a top general um, in Israel called Gaza a concentration camp. This was in 2004. This was before the siege. Before the siege, it was a concentration camp. In 2006, when it was completely besieged by the state of Israel, where they controlled the land, the sea, and, and the air, since 2006 until today, a population of 2.2 million people who can't go in, who can't go out, who 50% of them suffer under severe food insecurity, whose calories are counted by Israel in terms of allowing in humanitarian aid, who have consistently over the years gone through what Israel deems as mowing the lawn, 
which is Israel every few years going into Gaza, either with military on foot or by air and just murdering um, as many as they can um, in terms of, and I just have some of that here, in terms of their strategy of deterrence. This is a population of humans that have no access to human rights, that, have no f that had no future, who the world was forgetting about. They forgot about 2008, the Operation Cast Lead, which was deemed to be 22 days of death and destruction, in which 1,400 were killed, 350 of them children, 6.3, 6,000 houses destroyed. They forget about 2012, Operation Pillar of Defense. Again, an operation where we saw Palestinians being ruth ruthlessly murdered. 2014, Operation Protective Edge, which lasted for 51 days, in which 2,200 people killed, 550 children, 18,000 homes completely destroyed. This was them mowing the lawn as a form of deterrence, right? What you got to know quickly, and I keep saying quickly, in 2006, when Israel was still in Lebanon, and they suffered a huge blow from Hezbollah, a huge blow. So they left. Since then, since they besieged Gaza, they've been using it as a punching bag. They've been using it years, for th this many years, to show the rest of the surrounding world don't mess with us. This is what we'll do to you. And this was shown in 2008, Operation Cast Lead. There's a report. Please look into it. It's called the Goldstone Report. It was a UN report, more than 500 pages that documented uh, what happened in 2008. 500 pages by a Zionist Jewish man named Goldstone. He's the one who wrote the report. When he wrote the report and he talked about the killing, he talked about Israel using human shields. Israel taking children into homes that they thought were booby-trapped in front of them as human shields. The Israeli government went to Ramallah in the West Bank and they told the Palestinian Authority, they said, if you don't denounce that report, I'll turn the West Bank into Gaza. This became the strategy to utilize what they're doing on this massive scale to be a deterrence to the surrounding areas. So what that led up to which is very important to the context of Gaza today, is in 2018. So this mowing of the lawn, this lack of a future, this, if you are today, if you were born in 2000, at the time of 2018, you're 18 years old, and you've gone through all of these operations, you've lost family members, a lot of your family members are dismembered because of, of, of um, the attacks and the amputations that occurred. You lost your home, you've lost, you've lost your future. You cannot go in, you cannot go out. You probably don't have a job because of the high unemployment rate. 95% of the water in the towns that you live in is not drinkable, it's not clean. This was the future, the present that they lived in. In 2018, they decided in mass, in mass, like we're doing now, in mass, to protest on the border of Gaza, to say, we cannot keep living in a concentration camp and we need to be allowed to return home, as is enshrined in international law. Israel's response to this massive civil dis form of civil disobedience and, and civil protest was to set a perimeter of snipers and to pick them off one by one. During that time period, these protests went on for a year, for a year, for a year, in 2018. During that time, hundreds were killed, more than 36,000 were injured. The number of amputations were in the thousands because there was administered, just like Plan Dalid, there was administered directions to the Israeli military to shoot the protesters to give them lifelong disabilities. Lifelong disabilities. They were shooting kneecaps, is what they said. One sniper at the time, for example, in a day said, I took out 45 kneecaps today. And this is a real phenomenon that we felt here in Harrisburg when through PCRF, Palestinian Children Relief Fund, we housed and homed a young man who was shot in the kneecap during that march of return to come here and be fitted for a prosthetic. His name was Aiz. After he was fitted for a prosthetic and he went back, just like all of those millions of people, Nothing happened after 2018. Gaza remained besieged. Gaza remained a concentration camp. And in 2023, in 2023, 
along with the tens of thousands that have been killed. Right before Christmas, we got a phone call. Aiz and his whole family were killed in an airstrike. These are the people of Gaza. These are the Palestinian people that since 1913 have been fighting and resisting imperialism, fighting and resisting colonial settlerism, and the world has forgotten about them. And this is the story of Palestine, which we, didn't, we weren't able to get through a lot of it because of time, and that's on me. Um, but we got two minutes left, and I think either we end it or we can open it up for a couple questions. Yeah, so we're, we're, we'll go ahead and end it. I'm sorry we didn't get through everything that I thought we'd get through. Hopefully it was beneficial to a sense for resources um, in terms of moving forward with education, for academic resources, for activist resources in terms of what we're doing in Pennsylvania, in Harrisburg, um, as well, a part of an organization called the PA uh, Palestine Network, which is working to organize um, a, a diverse coalition of organizations and individuals from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia in terms of our organizing. So any questions about that, we'll go ahead and end and you guys can come up and we'll talk or I'll, I'll come talk to you guys. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. I know it's a lot, but...